Okay, I'm a bit tired to be making this recording, but I feel like I need to put this down in words because I think I've got it very uh, clearly depicted now. I, I think I've got all the all the all the pieces of the puzzle uh, uh, quite tightly um, in quite a good picturesque uh, uh, summation. So. Okay, so I'm, I'm first going to describe borderline, and then I'm going to describe histrionic. And then I'm going to describe identity politics and fascistic ideology, as identity politics is just another version of fascistic ideology, and explain how it's a hybrid of borderline and histrionic. It's sort of, it's histrionic in a social sense, but in a kind of spiritual sense, it's borderline. Okay, so that's what I'm going to go through. So, first of all, what is borderline? So, I mean, this is an addendum to all the other things that I've said, but this summarizes it quite nicely. So, the the weird thing about borderline is that because it's um, it's unconscious focused or it's inner child focused, the seat of consciousness is in the inner child, but it has this double life because it will also um, emulate... Uh, um, subconscious feeling bodies um, to play the game of the so to play the social game of feeling bodies and it needs to do this because it has to attach itself to somebody else's feeling body and use that other person as a host so it has to have a kind of conduit to attach itself to other people uh, to their targets in some sense now what they want is they want a strong host that can essentially supply them with with security. This is why borderline is prone to the kind of extravagant um, dysregulation and chaos. In some sense, they're testing their environment because they want to They have high standards to meet. They want to be associated with someone. They want to be um, affiliated with someone and codependent with someone who can take responsibility for everything on a kind of on, on quite a large scale um, because then eventually if they if then they they inculcate a, um, a codependency with that person it's all for nothing if that person can't actually take accountability for all the expectations that the borderline has in terms of the high status that they want secured and delivered to them and that, so they have a belief about themselves in the same way that the histrionic has an unconscious belief about themselves being special and important and high status and automatically having prestige. But they don't want to work for it in terms of like actually doing something um, to earn it. They don't want to earn it. They, they've already sentenced themselves to possessing it. Uh, they really believe themselves to be in possession of it. They just need... A facility to sort of uh, to make it appear uh, uh, valid and, and or, or, or to, to verify that initial presumption um, that is how they proceed uh, in terms of their their inner child greed, as it were. They have a greed for a certain qualification or aspect that pertains to their self-image, their self-portrait, their identity. So there's something special about their identity. They have a greed for that positive attribute that it just, the, their identity automatically uh, accedes to it. It just automatically inherits it somehow. It, it, it is just, it's granted. Uh, that's the best word. It, it's just automatically granted to their self-portrait, to their self-image, to their identity. Obviously, ideologically, that's, a, that's a, a slightly wider category because then the identity is a shared identity, but still it's a special one that confers specialness and that is just granted. Then, that's the greed on the inner child aspect. Now, you have to understand that the, the vector in which they're attaching this to other people is through a feeling body container, right, which is... Is in, especially in the case of a borderline, this is not even a, a persistent container. They, they, they can throw these away and replace them as, you know, it's, it's, it's just 
it's junk to them. They'll just build a new one out of the wreckage of the old broken ones. They will just slap together anything and they'll just keep on throwing different valences until one of them sticks, until something seems to work, until something gets some traction. They don't give a damn. Anyway, there is a there is a vague consistency between those different masks that they wear, between those different personalities that they will cobble together in some sense. And the overarching theme in that is essentially, um, you could call it, 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 it follows the same formula, not in terms of how it self-identifies, the, the, the social mask. The social mask doesn't self-identify in terms of any consistency, but it does follow the same tactical formula. It does always follow the same behavioral patterns uh, and the same thematic formulation, which is essentially what I would could. I, I would call it two things. It's envy concealment and it's concealed through empathy, sorry, not empathy, through intellectual sympathy, which another, an, a web of intellectual sympathy. And that web of intellectual sympathy can be summarized as the narrative, the story that they tell about themselves. So they are telling a story about themselves always that is, uh, uh, implicitly enforcing a kind of currency of intellectual sympathy, w which is woven into the story, which is ex expected from, from merely telling other people the story and knowing that they know what that story is, then it already ha has an entitlement. It already has an expectation. It already has this kind of coercive, manipulative force, this gravity. And that... That's an interesting thing because in some sense that intellectual web of sympathy is just essentially envy concealment. And that envy concealment is the the other side of the coin of the of the, the greed for the inner child. But on the subconscious so in some sense the inner child and the subconscious, if you can kind of imagine there's a portal, there's a conduit in which the inner child and the uh, subconscious are both doing the same thing, but things have to, uh, something from the inner child has to pass through. And, and also it has to, uh, the inner child wants, wants to extract certain things out from the subconscious. So they all have to go through that portal. Now on the inner child side, the portal is called, that's where I get my greed from. That's where I get my greed satisfied. And on the subconscious side, because those, uh, th from that side, it's being manned by a kind of, um, uh, uh, by, by a slave drone vehicle, you know, but by a throwaway sort of thing, which is essentially thrown away because it, ha the life of the subconscious of the borderline is this kind of envy and then trying to conceal that envy and excuse that envy and, and use that, that sort of that self-imposed envy, which is a very sort of self-diminutizing, you know, sort of discomfort and negative emotion. And to leverage that negative emotion against other people to enforce compliance with their narrative, to, you know, which is this problem-solution sort of narrative. Uh, uh, that they are expressing the problem and and they're trying to find other people to help them essentially help them conceal their envy by by buying into the 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 web of of intellectual sympathy and so they've got some you know some always a kind of simplistic oversimplified generalization oh, oh, woe is me woe is me uh, other people don't have to worry about this, but I have to worry about this. It's always based on contrasts and comparisons and a kind of self-pity. Um, now, that the envy, that envy filter in some sense means that they can speciously reject anything from the subconscious slave vehicle, slave container, that's just meant to appropriate this intellectual sympathy and enforce this intellectual sympathy and enforce the manipulation that is being sort of 
uh, greedily translated, the greed of the inner child is being translated into the envy filter in some sense, so that only it's it's a, it's a one way flow of control that they get to flow uh, they get to control other people's feeling bodies, but they don't control anything. Um, but but nothing comes down to the inner child and imposes anything on the inner child. The inner child is completely unassailable. Its greed is completely immune because essentially, if anything threatens that greed, they can just rely on the end on, on the subconscious side to say no 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 no. Um, I'm just envious. I'm not greedy. I'm just envious because other people already have it, something like that. Now the 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 intellectual sympathy web, in some sense, the the narrative, the story that that sort of covers that, is in some sense the displacement of a real ego function. It's a it's a very immature kind of brittle ego function, and that sort of the coverage that the narrative gives to the envy filter. Is something like the um, uh, uh, is something like that 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 moral sanctimoniousness that you see in all fascists, as you see in the identity politics totalitarian people, um, and borderlines have this you know they have this sadistically edged mean frame. Also, cerebral histrionics also have the same bullshit. Um, Okay, so I, I just want to explain now the, um, I think I should move on to histrionic. Okay, so you see histrionic, they have, they don't, histrionics don't have the greed because that's unconscious. They have moved on. They actually live in the ego cloud. They live in the narrative. The histrionics actually buy into their own narrative. They actually really believe it. And their inner child has become completely unconscious. It has become the unconscious side of the mind. So in some sense, they only know about the envy filter and they operate the envy filter. Although, you know, it's weird because I always think that there's, there's, there's always bad faith with this, with unconsciousness. Uh, you know, there's a, there's always a cognitive dissonance, uh, uh, that it's serving in some sense, or I mean, yeah, I mean, histrionics are like walking cognitive dissonance. But um, anyway, I, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to exactly delicately lay out the nuance of unconsciousness. I've done that in other recordings, but um, th that that's the distinction between the histrionic is that the histrionic, in some sense, doesn't keep the solidity, th the thread of the greed is not kept intact with the histrionic. That is left to be fragmented in the unconsciousness. So that isn't catered to perfectly in some sense, which means that the histrionic is capable of having a much greater consistency on the level of the subconscious. They actually have a consistent feeling body. They have a consistent container. They actually can have boundaries in a way that a borderline can never have boundaries because they are actually too entrenched in their two-faced greed envy filter greed envy filter and then the envy filter projects a multitude of different personages and feeling masks which they cycle between and, and they mix and they match and they just keep on using whichever one thing they think will, will be able to to uh, uh ma i mean sometimes they tag team between different uh, um different sort of you know they, they create seduction uh, they try to lure people that they try to create quid pro quo. They try, they do the carrot and the stick thing. They, they often do like good cop, bad cop w w with, with their feeling body because they just do They just try every trick in the book, every form of coercion and manipulation to get their host to, to, um, to, to essentially buy their hosts, um, uh, 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 the word that I'm looking for is, um, it's not compliance, it's something, um, what's the word that means, like when you're in an army with someone else, compatriotism, uh, they, they have to buy, uh, 
you see now the, you see the reason is not just compliance it's actually compatriotism because they actually have to get the other this is how they actually manipulate another person this is how they control another person is they have to get that other person they have to control that other person's sense of of affinity they have to they, they they have to get that other person to consign their soul away in some sense. They have to, the only way that you can fully control somebody else is if you've sort of, you, you've stolen a piece of their soul and you've locked away a piece of, of their, or, or the, that's integral to all their thinking, that's integral to all of their decision making. You, you have to find a piece of them and you have to sort of conquer it in some sense. And so the borderline is, is actually trying to get people to, I've described this before to sort of to sell them their key to their prime thinking. Uh, they they have to collect that key, and in some sense, they have to create a, a kind of a very sort of dark contract where where they are getting the other person to discard a part of their. Um, they're trying to get the other person to agree to limit themselves. Um, To sort of uh, 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 just in order to offer a kind of a token of supplication um, to the borderline's uh, uh, methodology in some sense because in some sense it's it's not a it's particular instance it can't be bounded it has to be unbounded so it has to be a concession made to the borderline's overarching methodology in some sense and so, I mean, the borderline does actually sort of try to get real denigration out of the uh, out of out of their host, out of their victim. Um, sorry, this is getting a little bit vague, but uh, I'll I'll describe it better in a bit. Um, yeah, I'm 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 going to have to talk about uh, a small thing in Scientology, or it's quite a big aspect of Scientology, but the ARC triangle, the affinity, reality, and communication, uh, these things are, are, if you have any two points of the triangle, you also have the third point, uh, you know, it's represented as, as a triangle. And, um, you know, it sounds very, very basic and such, but essentially this is why borderlines in some sense they play with semantics, they play with words, they play with communication, essentially, and then they disorientate reality, they derange it in their, in their victim, in their host. And essentially, they will try to get someone who is strong in those two things, in some sense, because they need it. They need the kind of reality check on themselves, even. They need it to provide them a kind of baseline as well. And because if someone isn't consistent on those two things, then it's hard to extract manipulation from them. So what they do is they try to find someone who's willing to represent those two points of the triangle strongly. And then they will convolute them in such a wise as to sort of extract a form of enforced affinity from the other person. Actually, that's not true. That's just true in my case. I guess they could do it with any of the two points to get the third. And I mean, perhaps certain borderlines might have certain specialities and certain sort of developed skills in their wheelhouse. But essentially, that's what their, that's what their vampirism and their parasitism is attaching to. It's attaching to two of the three points, and therefore it's enforcing the third in some sense by convoluting the other two in such a very particular, uh, in, in a very particular kind of confection. And that kind of disorientation, in some sense, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there might be other ways of, of describing it metaphorically, but that's sort of the easiest uh, that I can come up with. But, um, okay, wait, let me just situate this now quickly. So, So they keep on creating more and more clones of feeling bodies of slightly different variation until they can sort of maneuver an iteration. And it is, 
And essentially, they're not very good at doing this, which is why they have to give themselves permission to hit the reset button, which in some sense is just generally aberrative in terms of reality and communication, because suddenly you're always just talking to a brand new entity. You're talking to something that, that has a new integrity. So in some sense, you know, this all takes place in terms of a, acclimatizing people to a culture where trust itself is just fundamentally disorientated and deranged and unilaterally bounded by them. So if they can control trust on a meta level in some sense, then it, from their subjective point of view, if they can just keep an imposing sort of how trust is, kind of, is cosmically narrated, then they can sort of... Um, you know, it's like film editing, you know, it's like you can cut everything down to make it sound like how you want it to sound, you know, and, and that's what they do constantly when they change topics in the middle of a discussion and they have these fleeting thoughts and they and they bounce around and they have and they're always expressing their feelings and they're, and they're and the thread of their feelings is the main aspect of, of you know, that that's that's everything centers around what they're feeling at that time. And so that allows the context essentially to always be warped around their kind of autistic subjective envy filter in some sense. And in some sense, that's the only way that they can keep a subconscious face that is in fidelity with their inner child greed. That, so that, their inner child greed is what is absolutely consistent. Th that, that's the thing that that's their, their core character attribute. And then obviously that means that subconsciously they have an envy filter that has this very um, sparse, uh, spontaneous, uh, uh, labile, you know, uh, uh, um, volatility. Um, so... Anyway, um, histrionics in some sense don't have any of, the, they don't have the, the consistency of the greed. They have actually let that go um, unaccounted for in some sense, which is why they can often argue things on a technical point and not even realize that they're even contradicting their own substance, you know, because it's sort of the technical sweetness of something is just so overridingly, you know, th th they won't even realize that they have literally recovered the same ground and that they are actually contradicting one of the, one, one, one of the necessary premises of their case or one of the, you know, like, like they really are very bad at keeping track of, of intellectual matters and reasoning in general. It, they think that they're very good at argumentation. They think that they're very good at holding on to the facts, as it were. But they cannot track for shit, like, the actual substantive core issues, you know, which is quite ironic, their actual treatment of them is, is usually quite garbage. Um, you know, in terms of specialized subcomponents, they can be consistent, but... Uh, if you if you string enough of these subcomponents together and, and and if and if they're slightly complex between them you know they'll make obvious errors that are just you know you you can't even bring them up because if you bring them up you just cut into the technical thing that they just said because the technical thing that they just said they they don't even understand it well enough themselves to know that it substantively contradicts a whole other section of the thing that they were talking about you know, that's, you know, you know, I guess you can call it up your own ass or something like that. that. That's how sort of, you know, um, they just get in love with these buzzwords and just almost repeating something that sounds like it's, uh, it's new and fresh in the zeitgeist, you know, it, it, it's, everything has this kind of, it's, it's more that things have a kind of status symbol attached to them. They have a kind of high status, uh, um, or, or, or they have access to high status, you know, sort of associated with that form of thinking and with connecting that form of thinking. And it's, it's a weird kind of cultural appeal to authority, like a, a, an intellectual cultural appeal.
uh, to, to a style of, of authority that as long as you can sort of mimic, you know, and, and you know, there, there's so many of these sorts of pseudo intellectuals, but anyway, okay, so, so that's the histrionic sort of case, which I, I didn't, I haven't, it's, it's hard to actually dignify it more than that. It's hard to give it more integrity than that, or it's, it's hard to fill out more description than that, because it really is a kind of, there's all up in the air and a bit of a basket case, and it's more of a juggling act of it just sort of trying to perpetuate itself to some degree. And it's, and it's you know, it's quite, it's quite laughable watching it, because it is a bit like a sort of an ongoing circus act in some sense. And, you know, it, it's... And the only way that they can cover over the fact that they don't have any intellectual dignity, as it were, is by just being aggressive and being sadistic and sort of um, centering around sort of uh, uh, corrosively, um, you know, witch hunts and, and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, some of them don't have to be actively involved in the witch hunt, but they're kind of they have a conceptual sympathy with it, or they have a cerebral sympathy with that form of witch hunting in some sense. And that's what keeps their structure, their top heavy structure sort of um, compartmentalized in some sense. Okay, now it's very interesting that the, the, the identity politics totalitarian or just the identity politics ideologues in, in their sort of weird kind of totalitarian fascism and such. They are both. They have both of these qualities. They really do exhibit both of them. They have the kind of, because the greed belongs to the identity category, and then the identity category has enough rigidity but enough flexibility to sort of still act as a kind of unconscious core so that the kind of the rational alignment in terms of the, um, in the same way that the histrionic has this top heavy, um, you know, they have, you know, they really are hybridized. They really do have both the, the, the you know, the, the, the typical Nazi was, you know, this is, this is, I guess, in some sense, the brilliance of Hitler, that he was able to harness the power of, of, a, of a personality disorder and turn it into a weaponized ideology of, of essentially a kind of collective, um, as, I mean, Luigi Zorja came up with, you know, the collective paranoia, essentially, that Hitler was, was a socially successful paranoid. Um, I, I, would, I, I think that that doesn't quite do the... the the sophistication of the pathology justice. I think it is more complicated in the way that I've described it, uh, th that it is actually histrionic and borderline personality disorder. And in some sense, it's it's more borderline. Well, it's it's both in, in appearance. And in some sense, then it can, it can, because you see histrionics already were dangerous to culture. Like we always had these middling, mediocre pseudo intellectuals infesting things, infesting a academia, uh, corrupting institutions, you know, uh, uh, they're so keen to make these fake intellectual arenas and, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, and bring things down into where you can just easily replicate, you know, and manufacture, things that produce high status, you know, they like gaming systems, they, they you know, um, in some sense, uh, I mean, academia, in some sense, falls into this general sort of category as an, as an aggregated average, that they're just sort of milling over this, um, this gamified system of, of sort of being a sort of chaos merchant, of not confronting the whole thing, but sort of doing this middling, um, what I could just describe as, um, uh, it was described to me as, as, as sort of, what do they call it? Oh my word, I've forgotten it. I think it was, uh, did they call it neo-pragmatism or academic pragmatism? It's basically meant that like, we know that we don't know what we're doing, but it's good that we're specializing and gaining more knowledge because then 
when certain things are discovered, then everything else will click into place because everyone else was doing, uh, you know, was, was intensely doing the things in their own field and the kind of the logical alignment will sort of all coalesce. Um, so... I think it was cool. Yeah, pragmatism. Anyway, um, what else can I say? Uh, okay, so so we've we're seeing this psychological monster re-emerging as it emerged in Weimar Germany. Um, people forget that, uh, or, or they don't know the history well enough. Pe people don't know in general that Aryan studies existed before the Nazis took over, just as race and gender studies exist today. And these are, they, f they fulfill the same ideological function. Uh, you know, the Germans believed that they were inheriting genetic superiority uh, uh, identity politics people believe that they're inheriting moral superiority um, and and you know the the Nazis also had their allies I, there were many Jews even that bought into the conspiracy theories and and felt sorry for the Aryans um, just as uh, 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 people buy into the narrative of, of, of identity politics because it's that that envy filter, right, um, that has the, the, the web of sympathy, the intellectual web of sympathy, that has a pecking order built into it. That has a prestige status thing there. And in some sense, you know, it can be interpreted as, oh, we just want to redistribute high status. Um, you know, there's just a better way of, of sort of uh, facilitating this in some sense. And in some ways, I mean, people, you know, you know, the accusation of privilege and the concept of privilege is a very convoluted, weird sort of property in some sense, because in some sense, it's evil, it's supposed to be evil. But in some sense, it's also like the form of the solution, because it's like, you need an ideological privilege to counter the the uh, uh, the historical identitarian um, accusation of of the bad privilege. So it's like the solution is the problem. Uh, more of the problem is the solution, but in equilibrium, you know. It, so in some sense, if you had it as a kind of original sin. It's something that you can have a sort of pride about. And this is how you can understand that this sort of progressive spirit existed before, you know, the, 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 the Democratic Party, the party of the KKK. This has always been their mentality. This has always been the mentality of, of these um, uh, uh, racialist elites that, that want to, I mean, you know, it, it's a different view of society because you see when you have that kind of mediocre intellect that's really bought into this kind of fudged confection of reality and this process, the psychological process of engaging with things, which is so immature, it's got immaturity baked into it. You know, you, you can see how it, how it delivers comfort because it's like, you can just buy anything. Uh, uh, you know, you, you can just entitle yourself your way to anything, you know, that the difference between people that, that have high status and those who do not are, is, is just the fact that essentially, well, we just have to hope that money becomes the thing that is distributed in a just way, in an equitable way. And then those who happen to f have more money will be able to buy the degrees and buy the status, uh, you know, and, and in the sort of, in the weird middle ground, the, the weird oligarchical elite that are already are just happen to, to inherit a, a, a good position, it's like the fatalism then bestows upon them the, the, um, 
you know, you know, the, the nice things f for me, but not for thee in some sense, you know, you, th that weird kind of hypocrisy because they're, they're conceding it on the conceptual level, but on, on the pragmatic level, it's like, uh, uh, they quite enjoy privilege is something to be enjoyed and something it's even being built in the interim uh, as as the solution a, a counter ideological privilege is the solution and so if you can survive that process or, or whatever you know it's it's a weird kind of sacrifice you know it's a weird kind of human cannibalism in some sense um that has this weird kind of narrative of fatalism imposed on it from a kind of cosmic sort of level. And I mean, that, that's really like, that's kind of what the, um, what the borderline religion is. That's actually, that's closer to borderline than it is to histrionic. Well, no, no, actually histrionics, I think could be said to be that kind of sort of crocodile, that, that kind of reptilian carnivorous, um, Sorry, this is getting very metaphorical. The best person that I can think of to, would be Destiny. Ooh, uh, you know, there's a histrionic, if they, there's a cerebral histrionic if there ever was one. But then he also believes, I mean, he's also been hybridized uh, by the by the borderline um, identity politics ideology. So, so you know, the, there's the kind of uh, demon incarnate, really. Um, or a demon incarnate. Uh And you can see how essentially this allows all responsibility to be abrogated into this kind of systemic uh, uh, system. And essentially, you know, if he and, and, and then everything is, is sort of, well, the system should have impositions uh, uh, and, and interventions woven into it and um, th that follow these certain heuristics. And then these are the, the people that essentially just have this weird kind of relativism. Where are they judging it from? Uh, how the system should be run. You know, th this is... The only solution to this is the Fuhrer principle, essentially. Who will be the savior of the identity matrix? Who will be the arbiter over it? And will administer the ad hoc uh, uh, justice? Uh, who will be the mediator between the identities? You know, who who can can transcend that sort of that strange relativism that's baked into um, the identity consciousnesses themselves, which are separate but equal, but because they are separate, how do you arbitrate between them? And so they have all these weird negative tests, and essentially the only way that they can do it is through a kind of uh, uh, cannibalism in some sense, uh, until they can find someone who can control media itself and control reality and words themselves you know and you get this this semantic soup and confection and such of uh of just an utter delusional hyper-realistic hy the hyper-realism um which ends up infecting the body politic uh, to such a degree that it just becomes so deranged and delusional um, that nothing that doesn't, you know, provide total, uh, acquiescence, um, you know, is, is Poland, essentially, uh, and that's a Hitler metaphor, as, as Hitler in, invaded Poland, um, So what else? Um, okay, I think I've covered everything. Uh, although not so eloquently, but... Um, yeah, so the ideology is very... Yeah, in my last recordings, I, I went into some details which were very interesting about the pecking order, which was also not so eloquent. But it's interesting because it does show... That there's a blind spot there's a murkiness 
there's an opaqueness of a sort of double-facedness in some sense that the ideology doesn't properly attend to. It doesn't properly crystallize that. It doesn't properly attend to that that middle issue, that murky, that it has a gray area that it can't fuck, it can't function properly. It, it can't, uh, and so because of that, it's, um, and, and that's the kind of, the, that's that middle subconscious space which is the kind of which is a weird kind of space which is sort of impregnated with your own subjective imagination in some sense with your own subjective um, excavation of of projections from from you know so in some sense that same space that that some of the white liberals are enjoying is the same space that uh, uh, if you are higher ranking in the ideology privilege and less ranking in the actual privilege, that, that that's like, that's, you're allowed to enjoy murder. You're allowed to enjoy radical violence in some sense. So that, that's a sort of shared space of, um, of a weird kind of win-win on both sides of, of the of the issue in some sense um and then what's very hard for people to handle then is when they come across someone who who just negates that space entirely who will not who will not get into the process of enjoying it because it's only when you enjoy that space that then you become prone to the the other side of the coin as it were or or, or to the um This is why, you know, like, I mean, I, I'm not just saying that, like, the KKK were these same kinds of progressives. I really do think that the, the Democrats that, that produced welfare and extended it and such were the same people lynching. I, I really do believe that. I really do believe that that is the same mentality, that it's just sort of split between private life and public life. Um... And I think it's that kind of two-facedness in some sense that is inculcated. That, that essentially there's this, in the same way that they give themselves the ability to cherry-pick reality into existence in some sense by interpreting the facts the way that they need them to be interpreted to conform to this overarching structure. That it's the same ambiguity um, that has this private public, you know, it's weird because they call themselves anti-racists. But these are the most racialist, disgusting troglodytes that you can ever imagine. You know, they are just, they are rotten to the core. They are morally corrupt beyond anything. You know, they, you know, And essentially, the only way that they excuse themselves is because they essentially say that, uh, you know, we're making an omelet. I heard Douglas Murray repeat that uh, quote from George Orwell. It, it, it's so great. You know, you have to, you have to crack a few eggs to make an omelet. Well, where the fuck is the omelet? You know. Uh, Okay, I guess that's about it. Uh, this is a small addendum. Um, so apart from the general things that I described as the difference between histrionic and borderline, um, there is a behavior which is, I guess it does quite often um, 
appear in different instances or in different kinds of, of instances. Uh, it has a slightly different genre to it, but it is almost the same behavior, but it is caused by different, by different underlying structures. And this is generally in the use of ambiguity and vagueness. And I, I don't mean this as in, as in they're leveraging it consciously, but they have an interpretive um, speciousness. They both do. So like the histrionic will expect their their vagueness to be interpreted by others in a very particular way and the borderline will interpret they, they'll always sort of interpret things subjectively you, you know like along with their narrative like they, they're, they're very narrowly focused they're both quite narrowly focused in their field of interpretation in that they have to interpret things in conformity with their general worldview, as it were, even though the, their worldview is not detailed on the level to which that they could expect to extract that stable interpretation from the base vagueness. So it's this weird kind of unspoken rule of reductionism that they impose unilaterally in some sense, and they both suffer from that. I haven't described it perfectly now. But um, they both suffer from, from this. Essentially, it's, it, it comes from essentially them not having a proper principle of reciprocity. They don't, it, it doesn't cut both ways, essentially. And because the judgment doesn't cut both ways, because it cuts essentially according to the kind of the capriciousness that is necessary for the, the general structure's to not confront their own cognitive dissonance in some sense and their own hypocrisy and their own, you know, um, well, anyway, the, the reason why it's happening for the borderline in some sense is because of essentially the envy filter, the envy filter. And, and again, like this is not an overt thing that the envy filter is doing directly, but it's an indirect, um, consequence of the envy filter. So essentially because they're so used to being able to easily project things onto people um, and the envy filter doesn't allow a backflow of, of, the, of the same tactic be used against their inner child, um, which is locked into its greed sort of thing. Because the envy filter in some sense is a form of vanity. It should be... So they have a very... Lob lopsided vanity like they have a very dysfunctional vanity like most people's vanity at least allows them to to lose standing in their own eyes in some sense at least the vanity for all of its iniquity is an iniquity that should at least apply um it should cut both ways as it were but because of the envy filter aspect it doesn't, um, or the, and, and, and uh, especially because it's also in the process of being concealed by uh, uh, the sympathetic intellectual web, or the web of intellectual sympathy, um, which is canonically, you know, sort of, uh, uh, um, imposed through the narrative, uh, or, or through the story, or whatever, which the cover story, and the pretense, which is, can even be changing moment to moment for the histrionic. Um, that they're going in this new tact or whatever. And so depending on whatever tact it is that they're actually engaged in, they're like a bull in a china shop for that in that moment towards that particular vector of um, essentially trying to imprint the narrative onto the other person so that they can be, so that they can receive the correct marking to know, you know, like like what what they're supposed to, uh, how they're supposed to sort of coercively uh, be, be be pulled along, um, into that narrative, into that vortex, or whatever. And then if that if that particular thread of the vortex doesn't hook, and pull, then then they just issue another one and another iteration 
uh, tries to do the same thing with with a slightly different spin on the narrative. But um, because they're constantly doing that, they have a hard time interpreting things because they don't have a baseline reality. They don't have a baseline communication. It's all in the mix of that, of trying to rope people into the vortex. So it's very easy for them to go off on a whole tangent. It's very easy for them to essentially also, um, what's the word that means, you know, like flip over the chessboard and just sort of try to run away and abandon the whole thing if if it's like if it looks like that they can't win if they can't win then then they then they have a a, a tantrum um and they'll just you know uh they'll just try to spite the other person in some sense and then you know just, or they'll just try to create enough chaos so that maybe in the in the distant future they'll have um they'll have created enough of a, of a sort of emotional event that they'll be able to uh, uh, play that off as a good cop, bad cop in the future in some sense. So it's a way of keeping the potential of control alive, is, is having a giant tantrum, uh, is being able to, to come back and leverage that in some sense as, as, a, as a concession in the future or as a... Uh, um, Or as a big enough event for the other person in their in the other person's memory, in uh, so, so that you could use it as a juxtaposition, you know. So it's a game. It's another game piece. It's a another tactical sort of deployment. Um, it's really quite disgusting because you know it's just it's the, that's all it is. It's just more control. You know, the, the sort of the two modes that borderline has is controlling and and being more controlling. You know, that's sort of all 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 it is. Um, Okay, so what was I saying? So, uh, and then the, the histrionic essentially is just too caught up juggling that they have to interpret things. And then it's, it's very, in some sense, the histrionic will have, will have an explanation as to how they settle ambiguities and vagueness. It's usually never a satisfying one, which is why they don't like to sort of let's say, have meta discussions too deeply because there is nothing there because they're sort of, they're, they're just completely up in the air, you know, so, so that, you know, they're really quite shallow. If you get into any kind of depth, they just automatically feign, you know, um, ignorance and, and humility. And, you know, usually it's excused by some kind of humility heuristic that, you know, oh, who knows the answers to these deep questions. So, Obviously, when you say that, I'm going to interpret it according to some appeal to authority. And, you know, generally that's what they have, is they have this kind of this confection of appeal to a culture, to an entire intellectual tradition. You know, so, so yeah, yeah. So they have a kind, yeah, that's the word that I've, I should have been using all this time with the histrionics, is that they, they use tradition essentially to facilitate their pseudo-intellectualism. That's how they sort of, disguise their appeal to authority rationality rules as an example of this um but you know they can sound very uh, erudite when they're talking specifically on a on a on a you know on an issue which they sound like they've you know they've uh, uh, aggregated a lot of the traditional thinking in this, you know, and, and, and they'll sort of, they'll pervade the subject with a kind of technical specificity, which sounds, you know, so authoritative. Um, and, you know, this is the, that kind of, that, that pseudo-intellectual, uh, you know, I mean, this is the kind of mediocrity that crowds in academia, that essentially infests it and and corrupts it and because they've just turned it into a game they've turned it into a game and they've worked out what the sort of the introductory steps are in terms of how to frame something to sound authoritative and then they just make a few technical points and essentially 
the only way that they get away with it is because they find people to aggressively go after and to feel superior to, that they find someone essentially to, um, to leverage their high standing in contrast there too. You know, they, they need a scapegoat, they need a witch hunt essentially to solidify their, their authoritative voice in some sense. And this is how they supplement actually having coherence and a kind of cohesive philosophical position which they don't have at all. They will always excuse it as, oh, well, we have a kind of humility and then we have our kind of tradition of, of, of talking about these things, you know. Um, and so they, it, it's weird the, um, how this form of sort of tradition concealment You know, it's this weird, because I mean, how do you even frame that story? You know, it's, it's, you just, it's just a cobbled together sort of mythology at the end of the day. And it's just a cherry picked, you know, sort of, you know, this is where that sort of interpretive thing comes from. Um, because their origin story in some sense is so confected um, in a murky sort of convoluted soup uh, of... Of, I mean, you go down deep enough, it's just, as I said, histrionics are unconscious of their inner child and their unconscious side of the mind. Um, so, what was I saying? Um, so, yeah, you don't have to talk that much to, to really start scratching uh down into the sensitive, you know, aspect that they, you know, it, it's sort of, it's built on sand, as it were. In a sense, you know, the only way that they can avoid that, uh, uh, unveiling of their, um, shoddy foundation is essentially to to find somebody else to ridicule uh, to create a kind of um, an in-group out-group way of conserving uh, uh, the esteem or or some sense of of uh, prestige and efficacy that there's that they've got something valuable to fight amongst themselves about or something like that and it's weird because they need other intellectuals that are exactly like their kind of intellectual in order to collaterally support what it is that they're doing you know it's it's sort of it's the one thing that really does want to be cloned um because it doesn't really have reason at the core of it uh, it, it's not really constructed out of reason, it's constructed out of something much more brittle, like rationality, like just rational alignment. Just a kind of weird sort of brittle heuristic. Where you can sort of delude yourself into saying, well, when we have the last piece of the puzzle then will be proven but we can't expect that we can prove anything uh, because you know there, there will always be more pieces of the puzzle and we've got the best game in town we've got the best ponzi scheme conceptually um you know that's how they i had a very good recording when i actually described how people did this in an in an ethical sense in terms of the ideology of the borderline and such and the cognitive dissonance which is the same cognitive dissonance that the histrionic has but it's just stressed slightly the histrionic is, is stresses it more on the side of the ego function and the uh, borderline stress is the cognitive dissonance more on the side of the inner child or the unconscious side of the mind because the inner child is the greater source of consistency or character Consistency of the borderline's character is held 
by the inner child and the consistency of the histrionics character is held by the ego function, um, thematically at least. Uh, you know, I'm just repeating myself, so I'm going to stop this recording. But yeah, that's I think those are some interesting points.